Hi, right, welcome back. This is this is shit I was looking for right here. What? What people ate to survive in the Victorian era by weird history. Top Named tier. After Queen Victoria, who reigned in the United Top Kingdom tier. from eighteen thirty seven until she passed. You ever like stare at your fridge and you just think about that shit? Like like what the fuck did people used to eat? They had to be eating the same shit that we're eating. Kinda, right? Like fruits. Some kind of meat. Bread, maybe? I don't know. Asked in 1901, the Victorian era was a period filled with shifting trends. I assume there's a lot of grapes for some reason. Food itself was part of these changes, and the Victorians displayed resourcefulness and creativity in the dish. Look at this shit. They got plum pudding? That sounds disgusting. I'm not gonna eat that. Melons? I need a I need a plum plum though. Strawberries? These don't seem a lot of fruits though. Which is they prepared. Victorian Britons were a diverse bunch with eclectic tastes and habits, and the food they consumed often reflected their disparate sensibilities. Today, we're going to take a look Ooh, at what they people probably ate bacon? to survive in no way they had England. ice. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Channel. And yeah, let us subscribe know in the to them. Below what other culinary history you would like to hear about? Is this, this is all about culinary okay, for history. For entree today, we recommend That's kind of dope. Victorian styled video. I think it's just delicious. Among other things, Victorians were enthusiastic horticulturalists, and they loved to tinker with and create their own varieties of fruits and vegetables. One of the most successful fruits to emerge in the late Victorian period was the Royal Sovereign Strawberry. Developed by Thomas Laxton in 1892, it was luscious and tasty. Botanists of the 19th century were on something of a quest to develop a strawberry that was as large as the American variety, but as sweet as the European variety and Laxton's creation scored on both counts. His royal sovereign strawberry... This guy made some... They, they, I didn't know they had horticulturalists back then. <laughs> Thought that shit was brand new. This guy was making crossbreeding strawberries. That's kind of crazy. Strawberry was so How do you even do that shit? Such a hit that Country Life Illustrated declared in 1899 that it was one of the finest strawberries ever raised. McDonald's gave us the Egg McMuffin breakfast combo, IHOP gave us the Rudy Tooty Fresh and Fruity breakfast plate, <laughs> and Victorian England gave us the full English breakfast, typically encompassing a spread of fried eggs, bacon, baked beans, grilled... So I had this on the plane, um, on the way to, to Europe one time, um, they served us an English breakfast, and it was like, all this same shit here, I don't, I don't think there was any eggs in mine. But it was all this same shit and had these like um these fried uh tomatoes and I ate it and I threw up and got so sick. It, it might have been just because it was airplane food and like the altitude or whatever, but tomatoes English food just doesn't sit well with me, man, like like blood pudding and shit. Mushrooms. The full English breakfast remains to this day a popular meal. However, prior to the Victorian era, only the wealthy could afford to eat eggs and meat for breakfast. That slowly changed throughout the 19th century as the standard of living increased for the vast majority of the population. Isn't that fucking crazy that before they would just be eating bread and soup? Like soup water? Like that shit was just water, some veggies in it? That's disgusting. Even working class Victorians had the time and money to enjoy a more elaborate breakfast. Beer. It may be hard to believe now, but one of the most popular beverages of the Victorian era was beer. Okay, it's actually not that hard to believe. In fact, by 1865, British brewers made 25 million barrels of beer annually. Though it was widely consumed, Victorian beer had a relatively low alcohol content usually less than 3%. You might be wondering why beer was so popular if it did not get you drunk. Well, the truth is that the drinking water of the era, especially in crowded cities like London, could easily become contaminated with sewage. Consuming beer <laughs> was therefore a safer... Imagine you're like, just drinking water and it's like piss water, and you're like, fuck, man. Better go get some beer, some safe beer. And significantly less disgusting option for Victorians looking to quench their thirst. Mm -hmm. 
Since the climate in the UK made growing sugar pretty much impossible, it had to be imported. No one knows exactly when the importation of sugar began, but some believe it might have been as early as 1260. Gotta be from Africa. The court of Henry III. It's all shit come from Africa. It wouldn't be until the 14th century that sugar came into general use. But even then, it was incredibly expensive, commanding prices that in today's money would be about 50 English pounds or 70 American dollars per pound. Seventy dollars. It Jesus. remained a luxury for the ultra rich. However, thanks in part to the end of taxes on imported sugar in 1874, candy quickly became popular and could be found virtually everywhere in the Victorian world. One of the most popular candies was the bullseye. Right, Maybe those are the eyes of a bull. Those are pretty delicious. I can't imagine getting up in the morning and not being able to put sugar in my in my coffee. It doesn't make sense. Damn. The sweet treat wasn't as unappetizing as its name. They probably didn't have like creamers and shit, right? Sugary candies were I guess they could put like milk from their cows straight out the titty. The 19th century saw the birth of what is arguably the most popular breakfast item of all time, cereal. American entrepreneurs like Sylvester Graham developed breakfast cereals to provide healthy Graham cracker ass. Some took it even He made further. cereal? John Kellogg, for example, developed cornflakes as a bland food to curb people's sexual impulses. The guy that made the Kellogg cereal was a doctor. Holy shit. Because apparently he thought that was something people wanted. Processed breakfast cereal gained traction in mid-century America and continued to gain popularity over time. Anyone who's been to a grocery store recently could testify to that, as virtually every supermarket in existence today has an entire aisle devoted to products like Frosted Flakes, Cheerios, Honeycombs, and dozens and dozens of others. Low-key, I kind of want to get a bowl of cereal right, cereal right now. That'd be kind of fire, right? Let me get a bowl of cereal. Wait, let me, wait a second. Let me get a bowl of cereal. Alright. Alright, I got the bowl of cereal. Britons, on the other hand, didn't really take to the stuff the way Americans did. Instead, British Victorians generally preferred to eat gruel, oats, and porridge. Once you've had Cap'n Crunch, you'll never go back. They wouldn't really start to enjoy prepared cereal until the beginning of the 20th century. Working in middle class Ew, vegetables supplemented their diet with cheap vegetables. Cabbage in particular was affordable and a good source of nutrients. The famous housekeeping expert, Isabella Beaton, even <laughs> recommended fried cabbage as a good option for economical meals that would feed a whole family. But there were a lot more options. I used to hate cabbage, but then I tried it um, like stir fried cabbage over like some noodles. That shit is crazy, bro. In this department. Pretty sure the Chinese made it. Craziness. And then just cabbage. Onions were also a widely used staple, given their year-round availability and dirt cheap price. Leeks, watercress, artichokes, carrots, turnips, broccoli, and peas were similarly common, although some of these were more subject to seasonal availability concerns. By the middle of the era, things were looking up, dietarily speaking, and most Victorians were consuming some kind of meat at least once during the week. Not every cut or type of meat was the same, though. Wealthier Victorians, as you might expect, enjoyed the best pieces of succulent meats, while their poor counterparts had to make do with the cheaper cuts. Butchers sold most parts of the animal, making everything from the head. If you weren't eating meat before this, though, would you really give a shit if it was the cheaper part? Like, could you really know? Like, unless you went and killed your own cow and then had, like, the best part of the cow. If you're any other family who's just, like, now being able to afford meat, would you, like, actually give a shit if, the if like, the meat was a bad cut? Would you even know? You're just happy you're eating meat, bro. Head to the hoof available for purchase. A budget-conscious Victorian could buy That's a honey. sheep's head for three pennies, which would be just about two and a half pounds today. Denby Dale Pie. You sound dirty. Civic rituals and festivals punctuated life in the Victorian era, and food always played a role in such festivities. No one made celebratory food better than the community of Denby Dale in West Yorkshire. 
To mark national occasions, bakers in the town were known to create giant meat and potato pies. Some of the events that warranted a giant pie were Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo in 1815, the repeal of Corn Laws in 1846, and the 50th anniversary of Queen Victoria's reign in 1887. In the year 2000, the University of Huddersfield School of Engineering baked the Millennium Pie, which, according to reports, measured 40 feet by 8 feet, held 2 tons of potatoes, a ton of onions, 5 tons of beef, and nearly 200 pints of John Smith's That shit had to be mad raw, bro. No way. How would they even cook that? Victorians were keen gardeners, and their enthusiasm meant that they often sampled the fruits of their labors. The meddler, an aggressively hard fruit, wouldn't be an obvious choice for a meal. But Victorians gave it a go by letting it rot slightly. This softened the fruit, thereby making it edible. Softened meddlers could be eaten as is, but many Victorians opted to turn it into meddler cheese or jelly. Meddlers, it's worth noting, weren't unique to the Victorians. They dated way back before Victoria's era, and even merited mentions in the works of Chaucer, Decker, and Middleton. I had a lot of fruit, but I don't think I've ever had that before. No less than four mentions of meddlers can be found in the plays of William Shakespeare, including in Time and of Athens, As You Like It, Measure for Measure, and even Romeo and Juliet. While it may sound strange to some in the modern era, bone marrow was a relatively popular treat in the Victorian era. Chefs and diners would use a tool called a marrow scoop to remove the yellow marrow from animal bones. And it was much sought after, since as a fatty, rich food, it gave Victorians savory calories. In fact, Queen Victoria herself is reputed to have eaten marrow every day. Her one-time chef, Charles Francatelli, created marrow toast for her. His relatively simple recipe involves serving bone marrow, seasoned with ingredients like parsley and lemon juice, on toast. How rich do you have to be to be able to eat fucking bone marrow toast every day? You're out here bitching about avocado toast? This lady was eating bone marrow toast, bro. Turtle soup was one of the most beloved dishes of the 18th and early 19th centuries on both sides of the Atlantic. But the essential ingredient, turtle meat, was relatively hard to come by and extremely expensive. Enterprising Victorian cooks thus made up their own version of the popular soup. It was just like the expensive kind, only it lacked one crucial thing, the turtle. Something else needed to be substituted for the eponymous ingredient, hence the mock in mock turtle soup. So what did they use? Well, among other things, mock turtle soup could be made with other types of meat, like calf's head, brains, or organ meats. Oysters were part of the Victorian diet, but many working class folks didn't always have access to fresh batches of them. So, as horrible as this might seem to people used to modern standards, they often had to weigh the risk of eating spoiled seafood. That being said, a much safer method of enjoying less than fresh seafood was by eating pickled oysters, which would keep longer. Street vendors even sold pickled oysters for the bargain price of four for a penny. Not a bad deal considering the only alternative for most folks was to eat rotten ones. When it came to food, Victorians were nothing if not efficient, and they generally used most parts of an animal once it was butchered. This frugality meant that items like calf's head were a relatively popular and affordable cut of meat among all classes. And why wouldn't it be? Calf's head was a surprisingly versatile ingredient and could be prepared in a number of ways. Some recipes called for boiling the head, while others explained. I had um had cow brain in Mexico, and that was probably like top top three tacos I've ever had in my life. And that shit was so good. Like I I didn't even need to put hot sauce on it. I mean, it did come with its own its own salsa. Excuse me. That shit was bussin. Straight up bitching. That being said. Preparing a calf's head could be labor-intensive and required the cook to remove the bones and skin. The brains and tongue, on the other hand, seldom went to waste. Victorians loved gelatins and jellies, even savory ones. To make calf's foot jelly, cooks would have to boil actual calf's hooves in water. 
but they they do have mad cow disease or they did they had like an outbreak in england so maybe not eat that in england the you boiled know? water would then just be in case to form a rich gelatin incidentally this is where it's worth noting that calf's foot jelly is an ancestor of today's gelatin which is a chief ingredient in many foods beverages medications and other products some examples include foods like gelatin desserts puddings gummy bears candy corns marshmallows yogurts cream cheeses and margarine as well as a host of other widely consumed products it also turns up in non-food that that shit's from a, a cow's foot holy shit Items like cosmetics that's equipment, wild blue match heads and photographic films just to name a few that's right in case you didn't already know gelatin which is in all of those foods and products is mostly made from animal parts Anyway, Victorians believe that calf's foot jelly was a nourishing food for the infirmed, and recipes for it often appeared in cookbooks for invalids. Modern science, for the record, verifies that gelatin may play some role in joint and brain function, as well as provide benefits to the skin and hair. But the jury is still out on exactly how useful it is in those departments. So what do you think? Which of these Victorian foods... Holy shit, that's kind of mind-blowing. I did not know that that's how they made gelatin. I don't think I can... Well, I eat hot dogs, so I can't really, like, bitch too much about food. And spam. I actually just ate spam today, so... Can't be bitching about no cow feet. Later.